Bis. Thanks, Anosh. Okay, so some people, I think, missed the uh, couple of lectures on whenever it was, Friday, Saturday. Um, so I'll summarize in one sentence what the first two lectures were to explain this cartoon picture of resurgence that there can be multiple saddle points, multiple critical points. And the thing I think that physicists should learn from this resurgence formalism is that there's at least the possibility that there are relations between the fluctuations. There's no guarantee that it will always be true in every system, in every observable, but at least it's something interesting to look for. And I think I gave you enough examples to show that in a wide range of applications, this really works. So now I want to turn to some, finish off some comments about thimbles. And then I'll turn to a couple more explicit examples where we can really see this happen with two parameters, not just one. Okay, so the idea is if you're convinced that something like this should be true, then one potential answer to the point that uh, Shailesh was making yesterday is that the first step is to find some weighting of your configurations in your path integral such that you can actually evaluate something. And at least at a formal level, it's more or less clear that the unique way to do that optimally is to find the steepest descent contour of configurations, whatever that means. And you can take that as an operational definition of a thimble, the Lefschetz thimble. It means the steepest descent contour in whatever space you're trying to sum over. So that's what this jargon means. Once you have that, in principle, you could decompose the path integral into a sum over thimbles or possibly just the dominant thimbles, but you have to decide what that means. On a thimble, the imaginary part of the action is fixed, so you can pull it outside of the integration. And now this thing can behave as a perfectly good weight. You can do Monte Carlo, you can do semi-classics, you can do whatever evaluation you want. It's a perfectly well-defined integral, and it's as good as the integral is ever going to get. Okay. The difficult thing is this number n, the intersection number, which thimbles contribute. And the point is that that can change as the phase of some parameter changes, because these things appearing and disappearing, that's the Stokes phenomenon, and that's what happens at a phase transition. So that's actually what you're looking for. So that's what makes this a complicated problem and an interesting problem. And so far, you didn't really need anything about resurgence. I'm getting a bit tangled here. I think that's okay. Thanks. We didn't really need anything about resurgence here, but the implication is that resurgence will tell you something about connections between different symbols. So that can be a very useful chart cross-check. So one possible way to generate these symbols is once you have the subtle point, you can generate the symbol by solving this complex gradient flow equation. So this gradient flow equation, if A is some field, tau is some Langevin time, some flow time along the symbol, this condition will guarantee that the imaginary part of the action is constant, and it will guarantee that the real part of the action flows in a monotonic manner. Okay. So this has been tested in some very beautiful work in Chern Simon's theory. There have been some comparisons with complex Langevin. There's been some preliminary thimble calculations, and we'll hear from Andre, I guess, in a couple of days about a real implementation in some really non-trivial problems. So it's quite promising that this may be a way to attack the second comment that uh, Shellish made, you actually, once you've decided how to find these configurations, you then have to actually calculate something. But let me give you a, an example of a case where, which I hope will convince you that you have to, you're sort of compelled in this case, to widen your view of field space to complex fields. So how do you explain supersymmetry breaking semi-classically? Okay, so think of supersymmetric quantum mechanics to be really explicit. So the ground state energy is perturbatively zero to all orders. But it may or may not be broken so that non-perturbatively it may be shifted or it may be preserved non-perturbatively and stay zero. So the question is, how can you verify that or show that 
using semi-classics and, and specifically using saddles. So, for example, in the supersymmetric double well system, supersymmetry is broken. So how is that explained semi-classically? Whereas in the periodic Sine-Gordon supersymmetric quantum mechanics example, it's unbroken. So you need to be able to solve for saddles, you need to solve these complexified equations of motion, complexify your coordinate x to become z, tau, uh, t is the time parameter. And now this almost looks like two-dimensional classical motion, but it's not, because there's an interesting flip of sign here, and so it's sort of regular motion in the x direction, but it's the opposite way up in the y direction. So you can actually have stable flows because you thought you might fall off to infinity, but it's actually balanced by an opposite um, potential gradient in the other direction. So if you, have, if you take the form formulation where you integrate out the fermions, you just have an effect of bosonic uh, potential. There's the superpotential derivative term coming from integrating out the fermions. And I'll show that what actually happens in these cases is that in the upside down well for the double well system and the upside down periodic potential system when you include this term there's actually in this case only one saddle solution that starts at the minimum whereas if you start at the minimum in the periodic case there are two types of saddle solutions there's a real one that goes from here to here and there's a complex one that goes from here to the complex turning point that is out there because it's above, it's complex because it's above the um, top of the barrier here. Whereas here, there is no real one, there's only a complex one. And so normally we don't worry about those because those are complex configurations, but I'll show you that these are necessary in order to explain the supersymmetry properties of these systems. So in the periodic potential case, that's the second example here, there are two contributions. One from what call the real bion, the one, the one that goes from one of those peaks to the next one, whereas the one that goes to the complex point has an action that is equal to the one of the real bion, but differs from it by i pi. And now the interesting thing is that the contribution to the ground state energy, remember perturbatively it's zero, non-perturbatively it gets a contribution from the real saddle and from the complex saddle, and remember that the contribution from a saddle is negative in the energy, right? From the instant on gas picture, it's minus a contribution to the energy. So if you only treated the real saddle, you're in big trouble because the energy is supposed to be bounded below in, a, in these theories. And so the semi-classical analysis would immediately lead you to a contradiction. But the appearance of the other complex saddle, which has the same real magnitude, so it should be treated on the same footing as the other one, must also contribute, and because of this i pi, because it's a complex solution, they actually cancel to that order, and you have unbroken supersymmetry. Whereas in the double well situation, there's only the complex saddle, and so it contributes minus, but because of the complex nature of the solution and the i pi of the action, the contribution is in fact positive, and it's the correct non-perturbative breaking of the ground state energy. Okay, so one way to say, you know, and you can check that these are the only saddles from the classical equations of motion. So if you were to neglect the complex saddles, you would immediately have a contradiction with the supersymmetry algebra. <laughs> so, so what about the other saddles? On the previous slide, you showed not just, you know, the complex saddles, but here you have to bounce. So the bounce is not important for the, uh, for the ground state energy properties. We're just talking about the ground state energy properties. Okay, so that's a very simple example. I don't want to belabor it anymore, but the point is it's completely convincing that you need to at least consider the possibilities of complex saddles. You can't simply ignore them because they're complex. All right, so I should have gotten to that point at the end of last time, but I didn't, so that serves as a bit of a recap. So in this third lecture, I wanted to generalize the problem to the case where you don't just have some coupling or h-bar or whatever, but you also have another parameter which I'll call n, and the motivation is clear, thinking about gauge theories. But I'll talk about two examples. I actually reversed the order of these. First, talk about a quantum mechanical problem for the periodic potential, 
motivated by the fact that it actually describes the low energy properties of these special supersymmetric quantum field theories. And then most of the time I'll talk about this matrix model, because I think a lot of people here are familiar with that, and I'll give you the sort of resurgence perspective on that. So the main questions here are, suppose you have some information about weak coupling, what does it tell you about strong coupling and vice versa? This is the sort of million dollar question. We'd love to be able to connect these two different expansions. Is there a way to do it? And usual asymptotic is not enough to do this, and maybe, this is a reasonable question, maybe this resurgent asymptotics can help. So let's formulate the problem. Suppose we're calculating something, a free energy, an expectation value of a matrix or something like that. It depends on two parameters, some parameter n, think of it as the, the size of a matrix in a matrix model, or n from the gauge group, and some coupling. So generically, the weak coupling will be an expansion in powers of g with some coefficients that depend on n. Right? That's the weak coupling at fixed n type structure. And then we're used to the fact that this may be extended to some trans series type structure that has instant on terms multiplied by fluctuations, and those fluctuations will also be functions of n. Okay? So now I want to convince you that these resurgence relations that I described in the last couple of lectures also hold even when these depend on some other parameter n. So this is what mathematicians call parametric resurgence. Previously, in the examples, these were just numbers. But there's also the, the strong coupling expansion for exactly the same quantity, expansion in inverse powers of g, and there will also be some other coefficients that are functions of n. But you know, we're often used to the fact that when one of these expansions is divergent, the other one is very often convergent. But that's not always true. Moreover, I'll show you an explicit example where even though this is convergent, there are instanton corrections to it. So this is very weird, but I'll show you an you know, absolutely clear example where this happens and must happen. But there's another type of expansion you can make. You can make a large n expansion. You could expand, instead of expanding in the coupling, you could expand in inverse powers of n. And now the coefficients, you have a choice. You can write the coefficients as functions of g, or you can write them as functions of the Tuft coupling. They're different types of expansions, but that's generically the large n expansion. And now you should ask, are there large n instantons? Are there corrections here that are exponentially small in n? And if so, how can you uh, decipher them? And then you should ask that these are different expansions of exactly the same quantity, so how are these expansions related? And how can you interpolate between a weak coupling expansion and a strong coupling expansion and a Tuft expansion? Because it's the same quantity. Okay, so this is the question I want to ask. And it's particularly interesting in cases where there's a phase transition. So the two examples I'll show you, there is a phase transition where on one side of the Tuft coupling, the expansion is completely different from how it is on the other side of this transition. So let me show you a picture to start off. Think of this simple quantum mechanic problem. So just periodic potential, cosine potential. I'm going to write the energy as u for a reason that will become obvious on the next slide. And there's h bar, there's u. H bar is effectively the coupling, the way I've scaled things. So here's a plot of the energy spectrum as a function of H bar. Here's the bottom and the top of the potential. Cosine goes between minus one and one. And you see that deep down in the well, so this is effectively when H bar is small, so the height of the barrier is large, you have these very narrow bands. Okay? And but as you approach the top of the barrier, these bands become wider and wider, and eventually when you go above the barrier, far above the barrier, it's an essentially a continuous spectrum, but with narrow gaps. Okay, so this is how the spectrum looks. We all understand this in many different ways. But now I want to ask the question, suppose what I told you in the last couple of lectures was the expression for the energy here the weak coupling expression for the energy, so the expansion in powers of h bar, had a trans series structure where it was a multi instanton expansion, also with log terms, and there are all these weird resurgent relations between these expansions in different directions. But those expressions are not the expressions that you get up here. When you write expressions for the energy spectrum in this region, it's basically continuous and 
the gaps, the expressions for the gaps, the edges of the gaps, are convergent expansions. So how is it that this divergent trans series changes into a set of convergent expansions? And moreover, when you cross this point here, the narrow bands here can be explained by a one-instanton approximation, but as you approach the top here, the bands are no longer exponentially narrow, and you need infinite number of instantons in order to describe this. So these infinite instantons condense, come out on the other side, and the gaps on the other side are actually described by complex instantons. And so this is a you know, simple quantum mechanical problem, but it has a lot of rich structure when you look at it from this semi-classical perspective. And in some sense here, what's happening is that the degrees of freedom you use to describe the system here are these independent atomic um, um, just atoms, right, with tunneling between them, whereas up here you use a completely different basis for your Hilbert space in terms of just plane waves, right? So it's as if the degrees of freedom are changing completely from here to here, and you can even think of lambda, the Tuft coupling, which is n times h bar, lambda is increasing as you go up here, and lambda is scanning, it's effectively an effective range, an effective strength, so it's almost like a running coupling. It's quantum mechanics, but you can view it as a running coupling. And there's very, very different physics for large lambda, lambda of order one, and lambda small. So how does that happen? Now, why am I sort of interested in this beyond quantum mechanics is that this is exactly, not just similar to, it's exactly the problem of the low energy behavior of this n equals two supersymmetric field theory. So this is in the nekrasov shadashvili limit. There's an exact mapping between the energy U in this uh, quantum mechanics problem and the moduli parameter in this supersymmetric field theory and the action, which is effectively the Tuft coupling, N, H, N times H bar, is exactly, plays the role of the expectation value of the scalar, and the action from the barrier, tunneling through the barrier, is the dual scalar, and this quantum Matoni relation that was discovered through the supersymmetric quantum field theories is exactly the same thing as this relation between the non-perturbative and perturbative fluctuations that I mentioned last time. Okay, so this is not an idle comparison here. And there's another supersymmetric quantum field theory where instead of putting the cosine, you put the Lame potential. And again, an exact mapping. So now we can go back and look at this again, and now this, these comments here, far up in the spectrum is this, so the electric sector in the supersymmetric language. Near the top of the barrier is the magnetic sector, and deep down here is the dionic sector. There are three points in moduli space about which you can expand, and from the quantum mechanics picture, it's completely obvious what they correspond to. So here's the structure of the perturbative expansion at small h-bar, so small Tuft coupling. It's an expansion in powers of h-bar with coefficients that are polynomials in n, whereas at large h-bar, it's an expansion in inverse powers of h-bar to the fourth with coefficients that depend on n, and this expansion is convergent for any n. The expansions, the expressions for the center of a gap are convergent expansions. But you will notice that there are, this expression can't possibly be correct because when n is some integer like 2, this is clearly nonsense. Okay? So this is a formal expansion around n equals infinity, and these poles are what's telling you that there's some non-perturbative physics buried here. So how do we dig out the non-perturbative physics from a convergent expansion? We're used to digging out non-perturbative physics from a divergent expansion. So the answer is that there are complex instantons, and this was known to solid-state physicists from long ago, that in this periodic potential problem, what we all know is that the width of the band deep down here is governed by this tunneling instanton solution. But if there's a narrow gap up here, it corresponds to tunneling between saddle points in the complex plane, right? Because there are no saddle points in the real plane, because you're above the barrier. But there are complex saddle points. You can evaluate the action between these saddle points. That's a complex instanton action, and it gives you exactly the width. And in fact, the formula is identical 
for the width of a band and the width of a gap. The only difference is in one case it's a real instanton, in the other case it's a complex instanton. So that was known in the condensed matter literature long ago at leading order. And what's interesting is that the action of the complex instanton doesn't depend on the coupling like just 1 over g. It's got a logarithmic behavior. And so the exponential of a logarithm is, in fact, this inverse power. So in complex instantons don't look like exponentials when you write them in terms of h-power. They look like inverse large powers. Okay, I'll skip that. So, in fact, if we take this as that expression um, for the strong coupling expansion, we can reorganize it as a multi-instanton expansion because for a given n, you want to avoid the pole, say, when n equals 2 here. This is a pole, and all the other ones have n equals 2 pole. So you sum only up to n minus 1, and that sum gives you the center of the gap. But then there are splittings, plus or minus, multiplied by this complex instanton times more fluctuations. But you also have to cut that one off because of these poles. And then there's a two instanton, and so on and so on. So you can take this expression, which, remember, was convergent, modulo these poles, and you can rewrite it in this way that starts to look like a trans series, that there's a perturbative term, there's an instanton with a fluctuation, then a two instanton, et cetera. And the amazing thing is if you redo this, and it's still astonishing me, to me that nobody ever seemed to have done this, you just look up your favorite book of these expansions, rewrite them in this form, you notice that there's a relation between these coefficients and these coefficients that's exactly the same relation as the relation between the coefficients in the... Where is it? Uh, I guess I didn't write it. The coefficients here and here. Remember I told you last time there was an explicit relation between those coefficients. Once you rewrite the strong coupling expansion in this way, exactly the same relation holds for this and this, even though this is a polynomial and this is a polynomial. Okay, so everything's convergent, and yet these non-perturbative relation, non-perturbative perturbative relation is still present. And the reason is you're just scanning from a region where instantons dominate to where complex instantons dominate. Okay, so that, you know, simple quantum mechanics, but it has a lot of rich structure that's beyond just looking at the splitting of the band from a one instanton. There's a lot more there when you look at the n dependence as well as the h bar dependence. But this example didn't answer how it is I go from one to the other. I could talk about that, but I want to talk more about the matrix model. As you approach from this direction, the real instantons condense. As you approach from this direction, the complex instanton condense. At the top of the barrier, they're of equal magnitude, and you can use one description or the other. It doesn't matter, and they match smoothly. So this is like a phase transition as you go, as you scan lambda from zero to infinity. So now I want to show you that in, this, in matrix models, the same thing happens. So matrix models is a huge um, field, so I'm going to pick one. But I think this is representative enough of some of this interesting physics. So I'm going to talk about this gross witten wadier model, which is this unitary matrix model with an action that's some generalization of the cosine function, u plus u dagger, and it's the integral over un matrices, unitary n by n matrices. Okay, so this is a very famous model. It's a matrix model derived from a plaquette formalism of 2D Yang-Mills. It has two variables, not one, coupling and, and n. You can define a natural tooth coupling, the product of g squared and n, with a factor of two just for convenience. And this is an example as a set of parametric resurgence. We're going to look for a resurgence in the g variable, in the n variable, in the tooth variable, and see what the structures are and see how they change. And what's very interesting about this model is that it has a third order phase transition at t equals one, when the tooth coupling is one. So that's also similar to the, the uh, example here that there's some phase transition happening at the top of the barrier here. And there's an interesting well-known double scaling limit that's governed by one of these um, nonlinear equations, the Penevay equation number two, which is the one I described in the first lecture. And we'll see that how that comes in. And we'll, able to, we'll be able to do really precise 
calculation of what this condensation of instantons looks like. And there's very similar structure in just 2D Yang mills defined, defined on a two-dimensional surface, such as a sphere or a cylinder or a disk. And in fact, there's this very nice quote from one of Witten's nice papers on these 2D gauge theories, is that you can write the partition function, epsilon here is the, the Tuft coupling. What's weird about these systems is you can start doing a perturbative expansion and you discover that it actually truncates after just two terms. So, you know, how are we going to uncover non-perturbative effects if perturbation theory simply truncates? It's like a supersymmetric theory where it's just zero. Here it just stops up to two terms in the, in the large n limit. And yet, it's not a polynomial. It contains some exponentially small terms. And the question is now how to dig them out. And resurgence is quite powerful now of how to, how to uncover those. So here's a table. Now this, this, by the way, is from a recent paper with uh, one of my students. But there's a very beautiful paper from already 10 years ago by Marcos Mourinho studying the system, not the way I'm going to talk about it, but using something called the pre-string equation and difference equations. It's really an excellent paper, and I strongly recommend having a look at that. But I'm going to treat it in a very different way. So we can make th different types of expansions. We can fix n and look at weak coupling and strong coupling. Or we could take n to infinity and take the Tuft limit. But then we can look at when t is small or large. And then we can do this double scaling limit where we look really closely near t equals 1 okay, and see what happens. And I want to describe that these are very different. So at weak coupling, they're always divergent. And they always need a trans-series completion. But at strong coupling, the fixed end large G expansion is convergent, just like it was in that periodic potential case. But even though it's convergent, you see very clearly that you need a non-perturbative completion. So it's actually the convergent perturbative expansion you would write down is not the full answer. Okay? And that's a little bit strange, right? We're sort of brainwashed a little bit to think that these non-perturbative terms come because perturbation theory is divergent. This is a very clear example where that statement is not correct. Okay? And in the uh, Tuft limit, the strong coupling ones are themselves uh, divergent. But here they're non-alternating divergent, here they're alternating divergent. And remember that there's a big physical difference between those two. But now there, there's a thing that makes this evaluating this matrix integral um, easy. It, me, uh, physicists call it the method of orthogonal polynomials. Mathematicians have other names for it. But there's just a way of changing this to an integral over the eigenvalues of the matrices. And then there's a beautiful result basically from combinatorics that says that you can write this partition function as an n by n determinant where the entries in the determinants are Bessel functions, modified Bessel functions, where the argument of the modified Bessel function is one over the coupling, or actually two over the coupling in these units, but inverse of the coupling. And the indices on these Bessel functions runs from 0 to n or n minus 1 as you go through the matrix. Okay, So the jk entry of the matrix is Bessel function with index j minus k. Okay, so the diagonal is just i0. Next line is i1, then i2, i3. Okay? okay, so that's an exact result. Now think about how you would do asymptotics in this. You've got a big determinant. Each of these functions is just a Bessel function. And so at weak coupling, x is big. So if x is big, you know that that Bessel function goes like e to the x with some 1 over square root of x, and then some fluctuations around that, which is a divergent series. Okay? But remember from the first lecture that that's just the leading term. There's a subleading term, which is e to the minus x, also multiplied by a fluctuation, which normally you neglect because it's subleading compared to the other one, but you should keep it. I, I hope I convinced you in the first lecture that you should keep it. So now think of the structure here. You've got an n by n determinant. Each term has an asymptotic expansion that involves an e to the x times something plus an e to the minus x times something. So expand that determinant. Clearly, the leading term is going to be e to the nx. 
times something. But then there'll be plus e to the n minus 1x times something, plus e to the n minus 2x times something, all the way down to no factor of e to the x times the fluctuation. Okay? So that's clear that there's going to be a sort of trans-series type expansion and an expansion in e to the something x, summing up to n or down to n, and each one of those will be multiplied by an asymptotic expansion. Okay? It's clear that that's the structure. Okay, so you can write it like this. I've written it formally. I pull out the full e to the nx and some combinatorics out here, and then this is the perturbative. This has, actually, it's e to the minus 2x. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think when you expand the determinants, e to the minus 2x. With some fluctuations, and so this I call the perturbative, this I'll call the one instanton, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? It's also clear, for, just mathematically speaking, for a fixed n, this guy satisfies an n plus one-th order linear differential equation because each Bessel function satisfies a second-order equation. So if you multiply two of them, it satisfies a third-order equation. If you multiply three of them, it satisfies a fourth-order equation. If you have this determinant, it's basically a sum of n of them, there's going to be an n plus one-th order differential equation that it satisfies. And there are theorems, if you're not convinced, you can just do it yourself, that for the solution to any finite order linear differential equation, the fluctuation expansions around the different exponentials are related by resurgent relations. Okay, but you know, if you don't believe in a theorem, you can just do it and check yourself that the large order growth of these guys are related to the large order growth of these guys, et cetera, et cetera. They're all related. Okay? So the resurgence here at fixed n and weak coupling is sort of guaranteed and sort of obvious, actually, when you look at it like this. However, you could also do strong coupling. So strong coupling is small x. Now at small x, each of these Bessel functions has a convergent expansion. So it's equally clear that when I expand that determinant, I'm just going to get some convergent expansion. Okay? And interestingly, the leading term just comes out as an e to the x squared over 4. That's kind of interesting. And then multiplied by 1 minus, and now the next term is x to some very large power, twice n plus 1. Okay? And the rest of this stuff here is completely convergent. Okay? But it turns out it's not the full answer. Now that's kind of... Sorry? No, the, the, so the leading, the term, there's a leading set of terms that resum when you do the determinant. Okay, so, yeah, each individual one doesn't, but the determinant actually has this, this structure. This was actually pointed out by uh, Professor Wadi in his beautiful paper in 1980. But there's a lot of interesting structure here going on, even though this is convergent. So that's what I want to talk about. So the trick that we used is to use this relation to these nonlinear equations, Penlevé equations. So we already know from previous work that there's a special Penlevé 2 equation which describes the double scaling limit near the phase transition. But it turns out there's another equation, Penlevé 3, that describes away from the phase transition. And so there's this result due to Paolo Rossi that the expectation value of the determinant of u, let's call that delta, it's also given in terms of these determinants, a ratio of determinants, where in this one you just shift the index by one. And this guy satisfies a nonlinear equation that is of this Penlevé 3 type. Okay, so don't worry too much about the details. It's just it satisfies a nonlinear equation, and the important thing is that n appears as a parameter in the equation. Okay? So once you have a differential equation, it's absolutely straightforward to, to generate trans series. You just look at the leading behavior, either large x or small x, plug it in times some series, you generate um, recursion relations for the coefficients, it's completely automatic. Once you have a differential equation, until you have a differential equation, it's difficult. But once you have a differential equation, it's almost trivial. So you're absolutely guaranteed to be able to generate um, trans-series solutions for delta, both at strong coupling and weak coupling. And the interesting thing is that since n is simply a parameter, I'm going to be able to analytically continue in n at will, 
And since n appears like this, I can rescale x to t, and t is just n over x, the Tuft coupling is n over x, so I can rewrite this as a differential equation with respect to t, and when I do that, n will just appear somewhere else in the equation from all the rescalings, and so I can study the Tuft limit also using this equation. Okay? Moreover, once I have delta, it's directly related to the partition function. So, in fact, I can just solve for delta, and once I have delta, all the rest just follows automatically. Any other observable you want to write down can be expressed directly in terms of delta. And delta is much simpler than the partition function, so let's work with delta for now. So the weak coupling expansion, no big surprise, is a divergent series. The strong coupling expansion is convergent, but now I'll show you why it has a non-perturbative completion, even though it's convergent. So here's the argument. You can, you can do this at you know, n equals 2, 3, 4, you just expand the determinants, right? Up to about n equals 10, Mathematica can handle that, and you get some intuition that at strong coupling, delta becomes small. Okay? In fact, in the Tuft limit, it's going to go to zero in the strong coupling regime. So if it's small, that means we can take this nonlinear equation and we can linearize it. That's the starting point. Anytime you have a nonlinear equation and you want to expand in a region, strong coupling or weak coupling, where the function is small, you linearize the equation. That's the first step. And then you look at perturbations around that. So these are the red dots. The red things here are the linear firms. So you drop that term relative to this. You drop that term. You drop that term, but you keep that term with that guy. And the red stuff is just the Bessel equation, but not the modified Bessel equation, the other Bessel equation. So the solution to this that matches what you can calculate when n equals 2, 3, or 4 is the Bessel J function. So it's Jn. Okay. Right, so we know everything about that guy. But when it's linearized, there's also a coefficient, sigma, that you have to fix. And you can fix that, again, by matching to various values at n equals 2 or 3 or 4, whatever. Okay? Well, that tells you immediately that that has a convergent expansion, right? Because strong coupling of that is just the expansion of Jn of x, and for any n, that has a convergent expansion. And if you go back, plug that into this expression for z, and go back, that actually generates this series here. Okay, just taking Jn of x, plugging it in, that generates these coefficients. Okay? But now I'm going to convince you that that's not the whole story, because that just came from linearizing that equation. So the next step is you write delta as Jn of x plus something, insert it in there, expand to leading linear order in the something, and now you have a linear equation that's inhomogeneous for the correction. You know, the, the Bessel operator on the correction is equal to some combination of this guy. But you can solve that, that's very easy. Inhomogeneous equations are easy if, it, if the kernel is something simple like a Bessel kernel. And you, you find that delta has a trans-series expansion with odd powers of some instanton counting parameter, this trans-series parameter, with these delta sub k, where this would be delta sub 1, the leading term. Okay? So let's make some plots. So I'm proposing this is the full trans-series expansion, even though it's completely convergent, because all of these terms are just integrals of the Bessel kernel with lower order guys, which are also Bessel functions. So if you care to expand it at small x, they're always convergent. So here in blue, this is when n equals 5, but you can take whatever n you want. This is the curve as a function of x. The red dashed line is just taking the leading order, j5, and the black curve is when you include the next term. It didn't fit on the slide to write the integral, but it's fairly simple. And then you add more, and it just goes like this, and this, and this, and this. And remember, the transition, the phase transition, is at t equals 1, which is at x equals n, which would be at 5, is right here. Okay? So this simple expansion is giving an extremely accurate result, even at very low values of n, at the transition region. 
And if you care to add more terms in this trans series, then it gets much better and better, even beyond the transition, where it's not supposed to be a good expansion at all. Okay? But this should have, I hope, convinced you that even in a case where you have convergent expansions, you can still have a trans series structure of non-perturbative terms, which are these deltas. And you'll explain, I'll explain in a little bit why I'm going to refer to those as non-perturbative terms. Is that okay so far? I mean, I didn't justify it to you that this thing satisfies this complicated differential equation. That's just a fact from random matrix theory. Um, and the fact that it's one of these well-studied Penlevé nonlinear equations, everything about its resurgence structure is known. You can just check it yourself or look it up. And I'll show you some examples as we go along. Okay? But the main message, though, is that you can have trans-series non-perturbative structure even for convergent expansions. Okay, so what did uh, Gross and Witten and Wadier find? They found that at n equals infinity, when I translate it into this expectation value for determinant of u, this thing went to zero at strong coupling when t is bigger than one, and when t is less than one, it was a square root of mi one minus t at n equals infinity. So now you can just make some plots, because remember the expression for this is just some ratio of determinants, so you can just calculate this for, for various values of n. And the red dashed thing under here is just this square root of 1 minus t, and the black lines are for various values of n. And you see what's happening is it hugs very closely this behavior at weak coupling, and then there's some clearly exponential fall off to zero, in the strong coupling regime. Okay? And even at modest values of n, you start to see this sort of behavior. So the question is, how can we go beyond n equals infinity? And what are we going to find when we go beyond n equals infinity? The four, first step is going to be a series in inverse powers of n, but we'll see immediately that that's not enough. There are exponential e to the minus n terms. Even at strong coupling, where everything's convergent <laughs> in the strong coupling expansion. So how does that work? So let me go back to that different, I want to talk about the Tuft limit now. So large n, fixed t, remember, maybe I should write it down, t. So x was 2 over g squared, t was Tuft coupling with this weird factor of 2. So this is n over x. So those are the parameters. So what I'm going to do is take the differential equation that was a differential equation with respect to x, I'm just going to rescale and write it as a differential equation with respect to n, the uh, t. Okay? And so n, which was buried over here, is now buried over here, but it's a differential equation in t. And the way you can understand this thing is now very simple. At n equals infinity, I just compare that term to this term, Everything else is irrelevant when n is infinity. And now it's just an algebraic equation to solve this equals this, which tells you that t is yeah, 1 minus delta squared, okay? which is this. Okay? So that's the weak coupling analysis at large n. But now we can do better than that because we have a differential equation. What we now know is that what we should do is write this thing multiplied by a series in inverse powers of n, and the coefficients will be functions of t, right? But then we'll discover that that series is divergent. Moreover, we'll see that it's non-alternating divergent, which means there must be some exponential terms as well. But we know we can now insert an ansatz with its e to the minus n times some function, plug it into the differential equation, the differential equation will tell us that function, and then it will generate the series around that term, et cetera, et cetera. It's completely automatic from now, because we have a differential equation. Okay? It's, you, know, you can simply put it into a, a computer and ask it to generate all these terms. So let's see what happens. So I write this leading behavior, square root of 1 minus t, I multiply it, by a series in 1 over n, and you quickly discover that actually it's a series in 1 over n squared, just by matching terms, because the equation 
only involved n squared. Okay? With some coefficients that are functions of t. But then, uh, I'll tell you about their large order growth in a second, but you learn from linearizing around that solution that there's an exponential contribution which has e to the minus n times some function of t with some prefactor also multiplied by a series. And if I simply insert that into the differential equation and match terms graded by the exponential, I learn that this s up here is this function of t. Again, it's just just like perturbation theory, just match terms. It's very, very simple. You also learn the prefactor. And then you just get recursion formulas for these coefficients and recursion formula for these coefficients. And once you know those, you can write down the next term, which has e to the minus 2n times this times another series. And you can just generate as long as you have the patience to just expand. Okay? It's completely automated. So now let's look at the large order behavior of these things. And if you believe what I was telling you in the first couple of lectures, the large order growth of these guys should be related to the behavior of these guys at low orders. The catch here now is that those are functions of t. So it has to be true at all t. So now the first couple of terms, I, you know, I have more terms, but they just didn't fit on the slide without looking at, making it look too uh, cluttered. The fluctuations around the one instant on, if you like, have this particular behavior. Next term is a 1 over n, interestingly, not 1 over n squared. That's because it's 2n factorial growth here. And the large order growth of these guys is 2n factorial and divided by this quantity to the power 2n. And remember what we did in the first lecture, that if you have sum over n, n factorial, What's the parameter? Uh, well, let me call it... Um, uh, okay, what's a, what's a parameter? S. No, S is bad. Um, okay, y. So imagine expansion in Y, but if there was a coefficient alpha here, let me call it 1 over alpha, this generated... Okay. That generated exponentials that were of the form e to the minus 1 over y, but the coefficient here was alpha, because it was effectively an expansion in y over alpha. So instead of 1 over y, you have alpha over y. So the fact that this thing here, that S weak appears here, tells you that if any of this stuff that I'm telling you is correct, there has to be a power of that same function to the power 2n, and it has to be 2n because there's a 2n there. So indeed, you can check that. You just look at the, you, know, you generate as many of these as you like, and for any t, you just look at how they grow, and they grow factorially, and the coefficient is this exact same function of t. So that feels good. But then you look at the subleading correction, and the subleading correction, which has one less power of 2n minus, minus 7 halves, has indeed, as it should, one more power of the action, as the same function of t, and it has a coefficient. And the coefficient is a function of t. But that coefficient is exactly the next coefficient in, in this expansion here. Okay? So the structure that I was arguing is completely generic. Whenever you have any differential equation, even if it's nonlinear, that argument I gave you just when there was one variable. So this is an illustration that that same structure works when there's a parameter in the differential equation. That's why it's called parametric resurgence. And now the coefficients and the actions that appear are functions of that other variable, but it's still true. Okay? So say it again, the large n expansion is asymptotic. The non-perturbative term that you induce is a function of the other parameter, which is the variable t. Okay? So what that means is that as t, we're in here the weak coupling regime, so t is less than 1, as t approaches 1, this function goes to 0. Right? So these exponential factors are not small anymore. 
It's e to the minus zero. Okay? So that tells you that as you go to this transition at t equals one, it's not enough to take the leading instant time because s weak is no longer big. Okay? So this exponential is no longer small. And that's how this phase transition works, and we have to show how it matches to the other side. So what about strong coupling? We already did strong coupling in terms of x, but now let's do strong coupling in the Tuft language, meaning a large n expansion. So remember that the leading behavior was jn of x, but x is n over t, So what we actually want is this uni uniform limit where jn of n over t and we take n to infinity. So if you look up the asymptotic expansions of things like Bessel functions, there are four different answers for the asymptotics. You can keep n fixed and take the variable to be big. You can take the variable to be fixed and take n to be big. Or you can take n and scale the variable with n and take n to be big. Or you can do the uniform expansion of that last one. So there are four completely different, well, completely different, different looking asymptotic expansions of the Bessel function. So the appropriate one for this large n limit is to take this coupled growth where the index becomes large, but also the argument n becomes large. And in that case, there's the so-called Debye expansion, where the leading term has some exponential, and this s strong, the action in the strong coupling regime, is some other weird-looking function of t. Remember now, t is bigger than 1, and it has some fluctuations around it, inverse powers of n. And you sort of plug in the appropriate ansatz for... You just plug this into the differential equation, and that'll give you recursion relations for generating these polynomials here, these functions. And if you put in this ansatz, it's pretty easy to see that you have a cube of this thing here, not a square, multiplied by some series, again, you'll get a recursion formula for generating these coefficients. Okay? So again, if you have a differential equation, these expansions are absolutely straightforward once you know what the leading structure is. And again, now you can look at the large order growth of these things. And it's very interesting. The large order growth of these guys is again n factorial, n minus 1 factorial. Notice this time they're alternating in sign. The previous time they weren't, weren't alternating in sign. The power that goes with it is the right power. It's uh, oh, That's a typo, I think. No, that is correct, because this is 3. So there's an extra 2 factors of s strong. OK, good. 2 s strong to the power n. And then there are corrections. And these corrections are just the same functions again. So remember in the first lecture, you probably don't remember, but I'll tell you anyway, we looked at the expansions at large argument with a fixed index of the Bessel function. And I showed you that the coefficients at large order behaved in such, like this, and these coefficients were just the same coefficients again. Okay? I don't know if you remember that, but that's what happened. And now this happens again, but as function of t. So for every t less than 1, this is the large order behavior of these coefficients. Okay? So what I'm telling you is that this resurgent structure for a differential equation where there's just one variable, now in a situation where there are these two variables, whichever way you look at the limit, Tuft limit, strong coupling, weak coupling, these resurgent relations are still there, even though the expansion, the fluctuation coefficients are functions of some other parameter. Okay? So that's remarkable to me. There's very little that's actually known about that in mathematics. It hasn't been studied very much, this parametric resurgence, or there's, there's a lot of current activity about it. So now let me talk about the other type of expansion, because there's an even better expansion. So th this, this is what would be called traditional large n. Okay? And you discover a large n exp expansion, but you discover these exponentially small terms. But if you look carefully, you see that there's a big problem here. Because as t approaches 1, the prefactors are all blowing up. In fact, all these coefficients also blow up as t goes to 1. 
So remember, as, as you approach this transition point from below now in the, in the uh, sorry, above, in the strong coupling regime, this trans series stops being useful for two reasons. This thing also goes to zero, so the exponentials are no longer small. But also the prefactors in these coefficients diverge at t equals one. When n is equal to infinity, it's not a problem because delta is just zero. But if you want the finite n corrections to that, this is a really serious problem. And what's happening is this is as if you just did ordinary WKB. Ordinary WKB, there's a prefactor which diverges at the turning point, which is simply telling you that you were a little silly in doing ordinary WKB. You should have done uniform WKB which goes smoothly through the turning points. Same answer here. There's an expansion for this thing, which is called the uniform expansion, which is much better than the Debye expansion, much more accurate. So let me show you what it is. It's in terms of our old friend, the Airy function, which is why I spent so much time talking about the Airy function in the, in the first lecture. Jn, n over t at large n, in fact, behaves like this. An Airy function of this weird combination of exactly that same strong coupling action. And you notice if you now use the asymptotic behavior of the airy function, you get e to the minus two-thirds this thing to the three halves. So you recover this exponential. Okay? Is that clear? But the good thing about this is that this expression is perfectly okay at t equals one. So plotted here as a function of t, not of x, is j5 of 5 over t. And these two lines, the red and the blue, which are completely on top of one another, are the actual function and this leading expression. You cannot tell the difference on this plot, even when n is 5. And I could have plotted it for n equals 2, and you can barely see the difference. Right? This is n, equal, n to infinity limit. But even at n equals 2, you have to look really carefully here to see any difference whatsoever. Whereas the dashed lines are the conventional large n expansion. Okay? They diverge from both sides at t equals 1. And that's completely artificial from using a bad representation of this limit. Okay? Now the point I want to make here is that this is a nonlinear analog of doing uniform WKB. You're uniformly summing all instantons in the region of the phase transition, which is playing the role of the transition point. The, sorry, not the transition point, the turning point in normal WKB. So in fact, what you're doing is you're doing this resummation condensation of all instantons. Okay? By going through this uh, transition region smoothly. So that's quite remarkable. We're used to thinking of instantons as ex producing exponential things. What I'm saying now is that as you go through one of these transition points and these instanton, instantons condense, it's actually quite generic to treat them not as an exponential, but as an airy function of something. Okay? It's really quite remarkable if you think about what is the corresponding classical configuration that produces an airy function, not an exponential. And it's what we call a bion. So here, let, let me show you some plots of what actually happens. Let, let's calculate something like a Wilson loop. So a Wilson loop is expectation value of the trace of u. Okay? So remember I said that everything could ex be expressed in terms of this function delta. Well, likewise, this Wilson loop can be expressed in terms of delta. So now that I know the trans-series structure of delta, I know the trans-series structure of the Wilson loop. And here's a plot at n equals 5 of the Wilson loop as a function of t. And the blue line is the exact answer. The red line is this expression, which is the leading, just taking the leading expression for delta and plugging it in. Whereas the dashed lines here are standard large n, which fail on both sides of the transition. The transition is at t equals 1. There's no, there's completely artificial divergence in the large n expansion. So you have to be very careful not to identify physics with that. It's just a failing of the standard large n expansion. 
The actual thing is just going straight through here. So this is some uniform resummation of all the instant and all their fluctuations. Because think of it this way, this delta, its perturbative expression was Jn. Okay? Now Jn, that's got everything in it. It's all orders of its perturbative fluctuations. And the next term in the trans series I can write as Jn cubed plus Jn, Jn minus 1, Jn. That's also resummation of all of the fluctuations around the three instant time. Okay? So you've really resummed at each order in the instant time expansion all of the fluctuations, and that's what enables you to get this uniform approximation. Now, if I were to take n really to infinity here, you would start to see a kink in these plots, and that's the transition. But this divergence has nothing to do with the transition. Okay? So you have to be very, very careful about making statements if you just use a naive large-n approximation, you can be misled into believing that something's going on that is absolutely not physical. So the, yep. Yeah. So what happens, yeah, that's a good point. So what happens when n is infinity, as n gets larger, this gets closer and closer and diverges, and this gets closer and closer and diverges. So at n equals infinity, it's as if you're going here and then, and you're going here and then. But there is no divergence, right? But you can develop a kink in certain quantities, certain physical quantities. The region Scales with n, of course. Yeah. With n, directly yeah, with n. Okay. But, you know, there's a One turnover over also. Or... So. You, and you can see that in these plots from the beginning, right? The, these plots here. There's some, this thing's trying to go all the way to zero, like this, at n equals infinity, but at values like n equals 100, it's still, you can still see that it's smooth at a given finite n. Yeah. So the, uh, the Wilson loop is related to the eigenvalue distribution, yes. and the eigenvalue distribution is if, gapped versus ungapped at the no, transition. No, this gives you the distribution at finite n. That's where this... That's what it gives, is yeah. it? So you can get that from yeah. an integral equation, just yeah, as yeah. you say. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. And this is known to serious random matrix people. It's, it's sort of well known to a few people. So. Okay, but I want to stress that there's a physical thing going on here that is not very well understood. Remember the standard logic is you look for a saddle and you say that the contribution from that saddle is exponential of the action evaluated on the saddle, okay? And now what I'm saying is that the physics near the transition point where you need condensation of saddles, it's actually given by something different. It's given not just by one saddle, it's given by one of these sort of uniform saddles, and you identify this saddle and you evaluate not an exponential, but an airy function at that saddle. And that describes correctly the region near the transition point. So now, to understand that more deeply, you have to look at the integral representation of the area function, and you see that it corresponds to two saddles condensing, meeting at the uh, transition point. Okay, so this is exactly what happens in uniform WKB, that you have two saddles meeting, and the effect of behavior at this transition point is not an exponential, but an area function. And exactly the same thing is happening here. And this condensation of these two guys I identify as one of these bion configurations. And so we expect similar phenomena in quantum field theory, but I don't know of any quantum field theory where we can be as explicit as we can here in this matrix model. Except maybe in the 2D Yang-Mills is a very similar story. So the same thing there, but in some maybe more complicated field theory. So l let me talk about the double scaling limit, just to, to finish off. So this is also well known in the random matrix literature. This is a way of looking really close to the transition point. So you rewrite your, fun your function as you, you, go, you take the deviation from the transition point. So you take 1 minus t, or t minus 1, depending on which side. <laughs> 
And it turns out there's a clever rescaling of n to the two-thirds, which becomes obvious if you just look at the equation a little bit. And you rescale the function, so delta is this new function y, which is a function of kappa, which is this rescaled deviation from the transition point. And then the amazing thing, and it's, of course, well known, and this is really well known, that the transition point is described by pain level 2. And now you can take that equation for delta, that pain level 3, and it reduces to exactly this pain level 2, which is the one I described in the first lecture. Okay, so remember, we looked at that and we decided that on one side it had this exponential type behavior, and on the other side it had this square root parabolic type behavior, and there was a unique value of the trans-series parameter that matched those two regions smoothly. That was the point of that example in the first lecture. And that's exactly what happens here. And you can trace it back to this weird formula that Bessel functions suitably rescale, reduced to airy functions. And it's just an upgrade of that, a nonlinear version of that formula. Okay. And that means that I can now write an integral equation form of this Penlevé equation, that the leading equation is just an airy function, and then there's this airy kernel times the function cubed, and now you just iterate this, and that's how you get your trans series. The leading solution is when you replace that, when you just kill that and you just have airy. The next solution is when you replace this y cubed by ai cubed, and then so on. You just keep iterating. And that'll generate this whole trans series, which is the uniform approximation. Okay? And so you can make some plots now. Here, uh, I guess, black, blue is again the exact one. There's no n here. I, I've done the, the scaling. So this is the uh, strong coupling regime, weak coupling regime. If you remember from the first lecture, there was an exponential behavior here, airy function behavior going to a parabolic behavior on the other side. And the blue one is the exact answer. The red one is if I just take the airy function with coefficient 1. The black one is if I include this term with ai cubed here. And the green one is the standard large n approximation in the double scaling limit, which again artificially diverges at the transition point, which is now at the... Remember, this is at the where the deviation from 1 is 0. So right at the transition point is right here, where you change over from exponential to a power. Okay? And you see that this uniform approximation just goes beautifully through. If you include just the first correction, the deviation here is uh, three parts, I mean, 0 0.001 or something like that. It's a tiny deviation. Okay? So these uniform approximations not only don't have this bad divergence, they're also spectacularly accurate even the, the leading term. All right, so I think I've finished on time, more or less. So let me try and summarize. So I think one, there are several definitions I've given you of resurgence. One is that it's a way to unify perturbative and non-perturbative physics. I think we saw enough examples to convince you that there's at least some structure there that perturbative expansions and then exponential factors times other perturbative expansions, they're interrelated in non-trivial ways that were not obvious, but when you start looking for them, they're everywhere. So they start, are sort of obvious once you know what to look for. And there's some physics there and why they're related to one another. The other definition was that it was, it was doing complex analysis in a globally consistent way using divergent series. And so we saw some examples where you change through a phase transition that corresponds to doing a rotation in the complex plane, in order to match the structure of the trans series changes to a different one, but they can match across the transition. And somehow these trans series encode all that analytic information. And the relations between different saddles can be particularly explicit. The example I showed you in quantum mechanics, where you could actually generate the fluctuations in any non-perturbative sector just from the perturbative data, is one of the most extreme examples of these perturbative, non-perturbative relations, these resurgent relations. And I'll talk about that more in my seminar during the, the workshop, why that's true. But we saw several examples of, of why that's the case. And so I think at least one thing you should take away is that there's still things to be learnt about perturbation theory. It's kind of funny, but you can imagine that after all these hundreds of years of people using perturbation, there's still some things we still don't understand. And that if we understand them, we can take advantage of them. And I think 
being able to take advantage of them in some non-trivial quantum field theories will help to resolve some outstanding problems that have resisted lots of other uh, attempts. So I've shown you some examples. In the first lecture, it was just simple examples to set notation. Basically, any differential equation you care to write down, linear or nonlinear, even partial differential equations, any difference equation you care to write down, this structure is there. That's guaranteed. When you go to non-trivial problems where there isn't just one differential equation, maybe there's some functional equation or there's an infinite set of Dyson Springer equations, then it becomes less obvious. And then now people are just exploring. But I've shown you some examples from quantum mechanics, one from matrix models in large gen, and Ricardo, is Ricardo here yet? No. Okay, so Ricardo Schiappa will give a, a lecture during the workshop showing you some of the amazing results coming from applications to string theory, and particularly topological string theory. It's as if resurgence was invented for the subject. It's just really beautiful. I uh, talked about how it resolves this infrared Renormalon puzzle in asymptotically free field theories. At least we understand it now for these two-dimensional sigma models. There's still a lot of mysteries for 4D quantum field theories. And about multi-instant on physics, as I said. There's some relation to these SUSY theories. There's more to be done there. And um, I think one of the most encouraging things is recent work, and which Andre will talk about, to actually use this in not some abstract formal way, but actually to do some really hard calculations, real honest numerics and some very challenging problems to attack some of these things like sign problems and real-time evolution, for which this is at least potentially a new idea of how to attack the problem. And, you know, the basic moral is just expand, go complex, and uh, see what happens. So, thank you. Um, questions? Is that obvious? Okay. So, so you say here that, I mean, the expansions, the perturbative expansions around one saddle, around each of the saddles are related. So if you, for example, from a numerical calculation would know the perturbative fluctuations around one saddle, would that be enough to determine it everywhere? I mean, is this, can one make such a generic statement? No, I, I don't think so. And, you know, the, when we get to really hard problems, of course, the question is, how much information do you need about the perturbative expansion to deduce some information? So from these sorts of arguments here of the growth, if you can tell me the leading order growth of a perturbative expansion, so that means telling me whether it's n factorial or 2n factorial or 2n minus 7 halves factorial or whatever, multiplied by some power of some number, if you can at least tell me that information, and usually you can deduce that from about 20 coefficients, okay? so some degree of precision, roughly 20. Then I can immediately tell you that you should look for some exponential quantity that goes like e to the minus alpha over your expansion parameter. And I can even tell you the prefactor. Okay? So if you think of these large n expansions, it's not obvious, right, whether there should be some e to the minus n corrections. But if you can generate for me 20 terms, then I can at least tell you from, you know, if, if there's some large order growth that's factorial and whether it's alternating or not, I can tell you that you should look for something like this and then you think whether there's some non-perturbative physical object corresponding to that. And several things like that have been discovered, and I think Ricardo will mention some of those, where there were unknown non-perturbative objects that were actually discovered exactly this way. So that's, I think, the first thing you could hope for. If you have more information, you might learn something about subleading corrections around that sector, but it's hard to imagine that level of precision in some really non-trivial field theory. Maybe eventually, but... 
Maybe I could ask a question. It's about this uh, n equal to two and n equal to two star. Yeah. Okay. So when you say n equal to two star, what is the field content? How many dimensions? So same same number of dimensions, just an extra hypermultiplet. Uh, in four dimensions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's a mass deformation of n equal to four. Okay. No. no n equals two. Well, you can regard it as a deformation of n equals. Yeah. Basically, it's one more parameter beyond the n equals two. Okay. So. 